we at the SGX would just like to take the opportunity to have a quick 15 minute preview on the, I guess, the role of the food and beverage sector in the region, uh, the types of businesses that make up that, that sector, and how we can delve in and look into those stocks a little more in terms of the resources that we have at Singapore Exchange, particularly through SGX stock backs. So before we go into the specific sector, I, I just would like to draw your attention to our competitive investment returns. We know we have a great deal of investability here in Singapore and having a great deal of sector diversity, which extends through the consumer sectors, including food and beverage, has been a very important part of our long-term competitive returns on a risk-adjusted basis. When you compare our rolling 10-year returns to the end of last month, they came to 6.8% on an average annualised basis, and that was on an average volatility of around 19% a year. Now, in terms of the volatility and the return to the volatility, we, uh, we rank quite highly in the world in terms of a sharp ratio, which basically gives us the risk-adjusted returns over the last 10 years. You can see at 0.3, it's, uh, it's considerably higher than uh, some of the other indices. Um, I've got, I can send a copy of this as well. If anyone wants a copy of the slides, pretty much uh, you'd be familiar with my email address, jeff.howiesgx, or you can reply to those My Gateway newsletters that we do send out every Monday, and I'm more than happy to uh, forward this to you. Um, it's essentially, because it, it is pretty important, it shows that over the last 10 years, which does span a wide range of market events, you might ask why 10 years and not three years and five years, well, you look into what's happened in the last 10 years. We had Federal Reserve hike. Last time they did that was 2006. We had global financial issues, obviously, in 2008. The subsequent recovery in 2009. So you had quite a bit of instability on a relative basis in the first half of the last 10 years. And it's important to note that the Singapore stock market during those five years actually held its own and well outperformed the other indices during that time. So we might have, or we do have, a lower return over the last three to five years, but essentially that's because we started with a much higher base than the other markets during that rel relatively turbulent time. So there's the comparative returns. What makes those comparative returns? You probably would be well aware that we do have the region, in, in terms of Asia, the region's highest dividend yields. The dividend yield of the STI is currently 4.2%. The average across all the Asian benchmarks is around 2.5%. So dividends, as we know, are a very important part of our marketplace. Why are those yields so high? Well, you know, we have the, all the 30 constituents of the STI that have been joining the STI. The businesses span as many as three centuries, but it's just this last century that we begin to see trusts take their place into the STI. So now uh, one in 10 of the STI stocks is actually a trust, albeit a a real estate investment trust or a business trust. And there, for the outlook or for the shape of the STI to come as well, you look at the five reserve lists, there's another three trusts in there as well. And then there's also the international diversity. And this is also very important for our F&B sector. When you look at every single stock, the 30 stocks that make up the STI, and you look at where in their annual financial reports or semi-annual statements, they are reporting their revenue more than half, just over half, of that revenue is reported from outside of Singapore. That's when you take it on a market cap weighted basis. So we obviously have a lot of internationality, which contributes to our stability, i.e. if there's an F&B stock that's highly leveraged to the Southeast Asian region, which might be falling weaker in the past year, that might be offset by gains in an F&B stock that's facing China in the last year. So the ability of the two to offset each other does provide an element of stability for those investors that are chasing portfolio diversity. And looking into the globally food and beverage stocks, which I think is pretty interesting, there's a number of ways to do it. We have uh, global categorization systems, whether it's GICs or ICB, that do put F&B, food, beverage, tobacco, type of sectors within the consumer discretionary 
or consumer staple uh, facets of those key sectors. So generally looking at a consumer play. But you can spread the net a bit wider because if you just look at ICB, for instance, it will, uh, it will generate uh, some companies that, uh, like Unilever that are amongst the biggest, but it won't include companies like McDonald's, like Nestle, PepsiCo, Coca-Cola, and so forth. So if you want to group all the world's F&B stocks, it's sometimes best to just compare all the revenue streams of these stocks and see what companies are reporting revenue associated with either manufacturing or production of food or the processing or I should say integrated processing of food that is the manufacturing and the wholesaling just the wholesaling even just the retailing there are a number of types of businesses that make this up and in total you're looking at stocks that do report more than half of their revenue to these F and B type of activities account for over five trillion Singapore dollars all around the world in terms of Asia only 27% of that market capitalization is based on the exchanges here in Asia. So just over a quarter of the world's market cap in stocks that generate more than half their revenue in F&B are, uh, are situated here. But in terms of the number of stocks and the SMEs and the, and, the, and, the, and the growth companies and so forth, you can see we've got a lot more. Across the world, these type of stocks, as we said, not categorized per se, by the index providers, but more uh, looking at the stocks in terms of their specific revenue type, the F&B uh, types of revenue, 47% uh, of those 2,000 stocks are outside of Asia Pacific. So Asia Pacific account for just over 1,000 of the 2,000 F&B stocks across the world, which only add up to around a quarter of the market cap. And there's a good reason why, right? Like the fast food franchises, the, uh, all those retail brands that we're used to that are big global brands, obviously listed and based in the United States. But nevertheless, we've seen more growth here. In terms of the market capitalization since the end of 2010, the F&B sector across Asia Pacific has grown by 47%, outstripping the rest of the world, which grew by 40%. And when you look at the, uh, the actual number of stocks, they're up 16% across the Asia-Pacific exchanges since the end of 2010 to, to yesterday. They're up 16% versus the rest of the world, which has seen some consolidation, merger acquisition, delisting, and so forth. And their numbers, uh, their number of stocks is actually down almost 10%. So as we said, these stocks and these businesses, they range a wide field. So when you're looking at diversity, maybe F&B is not just one part of the diversity uh, aspect, but maybe you could extend that Throughout the uh, diverse businesses, uh, you're going to see some pretty interesting facts and segmenting of the F&B sector through our friends at CIUS. Not so. I was going to say CIUS Research, but I take that back. It's supposed to be Voyager Research, excuse me, uh, who have done a, uh, a great paper and, uh, and basically segmented and broken up our 45 or so F&B stocks that we have in Singapore into further segments. But these are just, uh, I've listed out here the examples of what manufacturers can be doing in the F&B business, as well as the wholesalers and the retailers. You can see canning is a big part of it. You can see that um, the foods, the snack foods, the pet foods, the breweries, the vintners, and the uh, distillers, and coffee and soft drink and so forth. It's, the sector is so much more than the basics of breads, fruits, and, and coffee and so forth, and the production side of it as well as the branding side of it is so much more and maybe not so much a defensive sector like the healthcare sector as well. Both are traditionally looked at as, as defensive sectors. Both in terms of Singapore size are very similar. You know we have around $920 billion in market cap, Singapore dollars, and we have around $30 billion in healthcare stocks. We have around $30 billion in F&B stocks. A few more F&B stocks are around 40 to 50 whereas we only have the 30 healthcare stocks. And we also have a giant, Thai Beverage being the big part, the big leader, and also a SDI constituent within the F&B segment, as well as uh, IHH having its role in, in healthcare as well. So just, just looking at the F&B sector here, while we do have a full list of 40 to 50 stocks, I guess I would draw your attention to the 10 biggest, which include 
uh, Thai beverage, uh, Q Q I F Jatpa, uh, Old Changhee, Japan Foods, Dairy Farms in there. You also have China Minjong, and where where the Fraser and Fraser and Neve, and you uh, you also have Petra Foods, and of course Sinograndis Super Group. So. Yi Hap Seng as well is in there. So yeah, out of some of the bigger stocks, there's, uh, these are some of the stocks that we might cover more in the regular My Gateway reports. For more information on the entire sector, of course, we have the research uh, industry participants, such as Voyager Research, that cover uh, right down to the, to the smaller catalyst side of the business. Um, what we can offer you, and I, I guess this would be my quick last slide in terms of looking in and dwelling into the sector. If you, if you are interested in doing more homework, we obviously have SGX Stock Facts, which was rolled out last year, the end of last year. It's been in operation for about a year or so. And this can help investors to uh, understand a little bit more from the, on the stock. There's obviously the charting and the corporate announcements, which is an important part of the platform. However, there is also fundamentals and uh, all the key variables there that you might require for financial analysis. For instance, if you dig in to the 45 and look into those stocks of the 45 that have reported the highest return on their equity over the past 12 months, uh, you can come up with uh, those five stocks, Select Group, Thai Beverage, Sheng Siong Group, Japan Food Holdings, and Old Chanky. Those five stocks together, they average an ROE, return on equity, which is basically your return on your net profit to the shareholder's equity. Caveat, it does not take into account debt, but nevertheless, that ROE averages around 23.924 for those five stocks with the highest ROE. And uh, over the last five years, you can look back in the charts in using stock facts and see that over that time, over the last five years or so, they've averaged annualized returns above 20%. Um, Thai beverage also being our biggest Thailand play has obviously outperformed the set 50 since it was listed and over most time periods as well when you make that comparison. So in terms of the sector, it is important globally. As we said, we're around five to six trillion dollars Singapore globally in these stocks. Uh, globally, in terms of all the primary listed stocks across the world, it comes to around Singapore dollars, around 90 trillion dollars in terms of the global market cap of all stocks. So in terms of those stocks that are reporting more than half their revenue, to any of these F and B type of activities, that amounts to around 6% of the cap of all stocks listed across the world. And it's an important part of our marketplace as well, as, as we noted. The market cap of the F and B is just the same almost as healthcare stocks, which can be an important part of your portfolio. But ever changing as well, not so defensive in some areas, and that's what we're going to hear a lot more about this afternoon. So. If you um, are still with us this afternoon, you'd like more information, we can share more on the SGX Stockbacks platform, the SGX My Gateway services, as well as all the good education that we conduct through the SGX Academy. There's uh, certainly a lot more, but in those three roles, obviously all we are trying to do is to provide some good education that's just providing the facts, simple facts to the market, not just uh, in terms of what's happened, but also pointing out some of the risks of trading and the risks of selecting particular segments and so forth. Uh, we can discuss that more in the panel and I'll probably be a nice time to finish this part of the presentation right now. Okay, we'll look forward to catching up with you again soon. Thank you.